We're in interesting times in America. All of those theoretical arguments we had in 2010 about Obamacare are now a nightmare for millions of Americans who lost the health care they were promised they could keep. It's a nightmare for young people who are discovering that they may have to pay three times as much for a product that they didn't want and don't need to cross-subsidize a government takeover of our health care system. We know about our national debt. We know about this jobless recovery that is leaving the next generation of workers unemployed and not even looking for a job. Something needs to be done. And I'm pretty sure that Kay Hagan is not the solution to that. Do you guys agree with me? Yeah. She has accountability. She has stood with President Obama on all of these policies that have done so much damage to our kids and to our health care and to our economy. And we're here tonight to try to solve that problem. You guys have watched a lot about what's going on in Washington, D.C. And unfortunately, it's not always true that our Republican friends in Washington are willing to stand up and challenge this president and to offer positive, proactive solutions based on the principles that made this country great. We can't just send somebody to Washington. We have to send the right person to Washington. And I'm proud to be here today representing the millions of Freedom Works activists and all of the activists here in North Carolina and say the guy for that job is Dr. Greg Brandon. I think a lot of people here know his story. I actually got the first opportunity to meet him tonight. And our team at Freedom Works vetted his record. We grilled him on the issues. We grilled him on the Constitution. We wanted to know if he understood what the solutions were. Because if you think about where we are today, it's not enough to pledge to oppose Obamacare. When Republicans take the Senate in 2014, in 2015, they're going to have to fix the fact that this president and, and Kay Hagan and the Democrats destroyed the individual market for health care. We're going to need somebody that's willing to lead. And it's our best judgment that Greg will join some people that I'm pretty proud of in Washington. Guys like Senator Ted Cruz, yes. Senator Mike Lee, and Senator Rand Paul. Yes. We're going to grow that Freedom Caucus in the Senate, and we're going to drive a positive freedom-based agenda that puts money and power back in the hands of people, not government. That's why we're here to talk a little bit about Freedom Works and, and what we plan to do in this election. We're not here to run TV ads. We're not here to tell people what to do. We're here to serve activists who are willing to actually do the hard work of walking precincts and talking to neighbors and engaging in the shoe leather politics of door-to-door -door engagement. That's our job. That's why you guys are here. Um, we've done this before. We're going to be outspent. We're going to be trash talked. We're going to be told that we can't get it done. We're going to be told that uh, standing on principle is a bad strategy, but we know better, don't we? <laughs> I am doubly pleased with our decision having had a chance to talk to Dr. Brennan tonight. I think he's the man for this job. I'd like to invite him up here right now. Freedom works. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Freedom works. I'm just humbled and blown away how he came here from five years ago, six years ago, preparing for this, studying the doors that have been opened up. I think what scares the establishment, scares the Democrats, is we have the truth and we know how it works. We're not here to reinvent no wheel. We're here to actually just get men and women who understand those core principles that built this phenomenal country and not waver on them. Compromising on constitutional principles have moved this to the progressive state. 
my story. I know I'm going to bore a few of you, but I want I got to repeat a little bit. My mom had issues about 19 years of age. Four years later, my brother. She was a, she worked very very hard. She had a couple, two, three jobs at a time. She said to her boys, go to church, go to school, or kick the rear end. Her boys got to live the American dream. In fact, my mom's first election, raised in a Democratic household, in 64, she got to vote for the man she wanted to vote for, Barry Goldwater. She understood the principles of the Republican Party are something to run to. Her boy, one of them became an OBGYN, her other son became an, uh, an attorney. We lived the American dream. I've been fortunate enough to travel the world, do medical missions in Africa, Central America. My wife and I have been married 26 years. She's over there, my, my love of my life, Jody. Uh, I'm tough and she's really tough. Um, we have six lovely, lovely girls, one boy. My best friend, my little son, he's 21. My oldest daughter is 23 and our daughters are four, seven, eight, 17, almost 19 and 23. We've been blessed to adopt three little girls from China that complete the family. You know when your family's complete, you just know it. Are we complete, Jody? I don't know. Okay, we have it. <laughs> when she knows it, we'll know it. But what makes America special is I've been around the world. I've seen the eyes of all different groups of people. But what makes America special is that we're the only country ever based upon the individual over the collective. We are all understand the idea of endowed by our Creator. But our founders put down on documents, the greatest philosophical document of all time, the Declaration of Independence. It's not just declare to England why we should be free, but to the world why men were made free. Then 11 years later, the Constitution, or Second Constitution, that put those philosophies into a written law in six pages, and the Bill of Rights, which does not grant one single right. It just declares God-given natural rights in which the federal government can never infringe upon. So our, our founders had asked themselves two questions. And I believe it's our generation's turn to do the same thing. Who is sovereign and what is the legitimate role of government? And both those are answered in the second paragraph of Jefferson's Declaration. Our Creator made us in His image, so we're sovereign. We're endowed with certain and rights, among those life. From the moment of conception to natural passing and everywhere in between, there is no such thing as quality of life. A third party cannot tell you a quality of life. You're all special. Without life, there's no, there's no liberty. And the next one is liberty, which is freedom and responsibilities. And then the pursuit of happiness. That is your dream. What makes America great is not succeeding, but the opportunity to try to succeed and the opportunity to get every single time we fall. I have fallen many more times than I've, than I've succeeded. So that's your noble rights. You're the sovereign. Don't ever forget the man or woman in the mayor is sovereign. Then the next question is, what is the legitimate role of a government? It's the very next sentence. To secure these rights, which rights? Your noble rights of the individual. A government institute amongst men driving the just powers from consent of the government. We've given our consent not to be ruled over, but of unbiased umpires to make the field level to opportunity at the beginning stage. And the moment a government oversteps its bounds, it's now illegitimate. I had, I had, I had the Reverend Charles make fun of the word tyranny. So tyranny means something. Because that right there, Jefferson listed 28 things he called tyranny. That's our declaration. That's our founding fathers. I always talk about the 56 men that signed the declaration, but how about the, 50, how about the wives at home with the kids? Put the food on the table. Put the income on the table to survive. I think Adams left his wife basically out of eight years, almost a whole till eight years. They risked it out. Those 56 men and their families, by saying they pledged their life, their fortune, but most important, their sacred honor, they changed the world. We will not show them the respect if we run away from those principles. Yes, America has warts. At the beginning, we, did, we said people of darker pigment are, are a property, not humans. We went through that. We said women have equal rights. We went through that. And by the way, those are Republican things. Martin Luther King is Republican. Susan B. Anthony is Republican. Farrah Doug is Republican. But well, take that message is it, it, it unifies America. Again, don't forget our motto, from many, one. We keep our separate ethnic cultures but bind to the common of American culture which is the rule of law, common language, sovereign borders. 
We be a republic. When we show the rest of the world what that shining city is, that's what we can talk about. Be an example for the world. We don't need to be a democracy. That's two wolves and sheep vote what's for dinner. A republic is wolves and sheep don't eat each other. So today I want to answer a lot of questions, but on any topics you have. But I want to go over the little history out here on the, on the Constitution, because this, that's the job I'm running for. It's Article 1, Section 3. The Constitution limits the federal government. It limits the federal government. And Article 1, Section 8 gives the federal government 18 functions. The checks and balances, I'll go over that. The legislative branch has roughly 33 functions. The executive branch has 13. Side note, of the 13, the ones for foreign policy only has one they can do unilaterally. That's actually saying hello to ambassadors and ministers. Foreign policy must be at the origin of the intent, according to Hamilton and Madison, at the exact time when all the things are discussed. Not a vice thing that says it means to put a stamp of approval. It means you're part of the process the whole way. And then the judicial branch has six functions to actually give their opinion on six types of cases, but no power to enforce them. All law is the legislative branch. So checks and balances are intertwined amongst those. But the most important checks and balances are the vertical. The top of it is the sovereign. Look in the mirror. That is the top of the pyramid. We delegated our liberties, a little bit of our responsibility to the state to allow us to live our lives. Roads, take care of clean water, go live your lives. To make a more perfect union, our state delegated 18 functions. But how does that all stay together? I think a couple quotes are important here. Washington said, we the people are the true keepers of the Constitution. That's why Free Works is back. That's why the people are back. We're doing, our, we're doing our obligation. Jefferson said, our peculiar security is based on the fact we have a written Constitution. Let's not make it a blank piece of paper by construction. So we have, we're, we're responsible for this. And don't forget, Jefferson was not in the debates. He was in Paris. So he said, if you know what the Constitution means, ask its friends. We prepare, we study what they want to do. And then the last quote is, is Madison. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And for those men that ought to be their own governors, they must understand the power that knowledge gives. So we here study those six pages. We study the, the, the Bill of Rights. We understand the Ninth Amendment protects the individual, the Tenth protects the sovereign state, and the most important phrase, Article 6, is where I give my oath, but in Article 6, Clause 2, it says the supreme law of the land, the Constitution, is in pursuant thereof. We have to hold them accountable to those 18 functions. We do that the next 40 years. It will be better than our last 335 years. Because that's when we take the founding principles and apply to every man or woman, no matter who they are, where they're from, and they have all those beautiful ideals held out there. The future is so much brighter. But if we don't stand firm, we'll not have a future. So I believe this message goes everywhere. And we're taking it everywhere. Let them try to divide us. We're not. It's like, it's like a metal. A pure metal strong. But an alloy made of multiple metals intertwined is unbreakable. That's the American exceptionalism that we're here to fight for. So I'm asking you guys for three things. Only three things. And I'll, you'll get mine. I want your life, your <laughs> fortune, and the most important, your sacred honor. We do that. I'm doing that correctly, you're doing that correctly. When you fall or I fall, we help each other up. And for those men and women and next generation don't really believe that, we go to them with love and kindness and explain to them that the individual is the key. We do that with love and kindness, we're going to break, break barriers that are going to be phenomenal. We know from the polls, we're doing that. We're the, we're the campaign that's been that's put together, put together a coalition of victory of, of North Carolinians. We're blessed enough to be backed by Freedom Works. This is phenomenal. Ram Paul, Ron Paul, White Church, Eric Erickson, Ann Colton, Dudley Brown. You know, this is a this is a team that loves, that loves this country. We're not going to run away from it. We're going to run towards it. So again, I want those three things. You got mine, and I'm honored to work with you for, for victory May 6th and then in November. Thank you so much.